Well, my name is James Crow, commonly called Jim. I'm Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin, where I've been since 1948. My name is Daniel Hartle. I'm a geneticist at Harvard University, and it is my pleasure this morning to interview uh, one of the premier geneticists of his generation. Let's uh, start with your personal background. Uh, I was born in January 1916, and it's a famous date in genetics because that's the time, time when the journal itself was founded. Mm -hmm. And I can make one announcement, and that is that we were both scheduled to arrive in January, and I arrived on time. The journal was a month or two late. My uh, father went to school at the University of Kansas and studied with McClung, the grasshopper cytologist, and then moved to Pennsylvania with him and taught for a while at Ursinus College near Philadelphia, and that's where I was born. When I was two years old, he moved to Wichita, Kansas, and taught at the same school where he had been a student, called Fringe University. And in, in Wichita, did you go to public school? Or yes, I school? did. I went to public schools. I went to a rural school for a while, a two-room school, which is a nice experience to have, with several grades in the same room. And then I went through the public schools in Wichita, and then went to college at the same place where my father taught. Mm -hmm. He taught all the biology there, so all the biology courses that I took were we're from Friends, Friends University. Friends University. Uh, let's, <clears throat> let's back up a bit. Uh, one, of, one of the things that you're known for socially in Madison is playing with the local orchestra, uh, violin and cello, mm -hmm. uh, violin and viola, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. uh, when did you get interested in music? Uh, when I was a small child, uh, I don't remember how old, five, five years old or something like that, there was a fire in our neighborhood, and somehow or other I associated that fire with a particular phonograph record. It was of Eddie Brown playing McDowell's To a Wild Rose. <coughs> and ever afterward, whenever that record was played, I would go over in the corner of the room and cry. Well, of course, my parents interpreted this as deep musical feeling and gave me violin lessons. Uh, actually, I started out studying piano and then took up the violin a little bit later and started out in high school maybe with the idea of becoming a musician. And then <coughs> I discovered in good time that I didn't have a, the right amount of talent and nor the willingness to work that hard at it. So in college then, I, uh, <clears throat> I did take some music courses, but, the, uh, but I took physics at first, liked it very much, and might very well have majored in it. And then I shifted to chemistry and then ultimately to biology and ended up with uh, chemistry and biology majors. And after you graduated from college, you went to graduate school immediately? Yes, immediately. I applied for graduate work, got turned down by Caltech and Harvard, as a matter of fact, but I was accepted at the University of Texas. Uh, I also applied to the University of Wisconsin and was ultimately accepted by Wisconsin, but by the time Wisconsin accepted me, I'd already, I'd already received the offer from Texas and I was too panicked not to accept it immediately. If these two offers had come in the other order, I would be a biochemist because the uh, Wisconsin offer was in biochemistry. You happen to have ended up in a field of genetics that, that uses mathematics. Yes, in a I did. Very serious way. Mm -hmm. do you, do you date, was that an intrinsic interest in mathematics, or is that a carryover from physics? Well, I enjoyed mathematics all all along, uh, but I didn't go into genetics for that reason particularly. Uh, I I think I went into genetics for the wrong reasons possibly. Uh, I, the textbook we used it was by Sennett and Dunn, a uh, popular book at the time, and I loved the problems in the book. I enjoyed doing those things, and uh, <clears throat> that's part of what attracted me to the subject. Uh, when I applied for graduate work in, in Texas, then I was accepted there, and I thought I would be studying with Muller, who was in Russia at the moment, but I, what I didn't know was that he wasn't expecting to come back. So I never did uh, work with Muller as I'd expected to, but the dis disappointment was short-lived. I had a very happy graduate experience with uh, Patterson, my major professor, and Stone, uh, the person there that I actually worked most closely, most closely with. Who else was uh, on the <coughs> faculty at that time in genetic-related areas? Uh, Painter was the other person. Uh, Painter was a cytologist who had uh, worked with human chromosomes, got the wrong number, in fact, but he redeemed himself by uh, being the discoverer of uh, salivary gland chromosomes, or at least the person who first made use of salivary gland chromosomes mm -hmm. for uh, 
for Snyder's genetic work. So I saw him regularly, too. But most of my associations were with Patterson and Stone. Uh, were you a teaching assistant? Yes, I was. I taught the embryology and cytology courses, the laboratories, mm -hmm. in both of those during this whole period. What did you do your thesis on? At that time, Patterson was very interested in collecting Drosophila of all, of all sorts of species. And the particular one that was more or less assigned to me was the Mulleri group. So that was what my thesis was. Uh, there's not very much that's memorable in that thesis. I simply study different kinds of isolating mechanisms. But I did find one mutant that had uh, no very great effect within the species, but was lethal between species, which was not new, but it was interesting at, at the time. One other thing about this is that when I was in graduate school, I really expected to be a teacher. I, did, I wasn't sure that I was cut out for research. I worked more closely with Stone, although officially I was Patterson's student. This was in about the era that they were writing their now famous book, uh, the yes. Genetics and Biology of Drosophila. When I first came there, they were working on uh, uh, segregation and the relationship between meiosis and, and crossing over. Mm -hmm. And I, and I uh, helped Stone with some mathematical problems the first year I was there. That sort of, I think, got me off on a good start with Stone. We liked each other anyhow. And he encouraged me to read uh, Wright's papers. He knew I'd enjoy them. He also encouraged me to take courses in, in mathematics and statistics. Uh, so I, I did that, and I enjoyed the subject. And I tried to read Wright's papers without very much success. And I tried over the next several years, even after finishing graduate school. And in fact, my ambition as a graduate student was to get a postdoctoral fellowship with Wright. And uh, <clears throat> I, well, it, it didn't materialize for a very good reason. I graduated in 1941, and it was pretty clear in that year that we were going to be in the war pretty soon. And this was no year to be doing a postdoc. Mm -hmm. So I uh, took the uh, only job that I was offered, uh, a teaching job, which was at Dartmouth College. I, let's go back to Patterson and Stone for one second. Where, what was their background? The uh, Stone was, the grad, was a student of Muller. Mm -hmm. And Patterson uh, was from the University of Chicago. I'm not quite sure who his major professor was, but it was in embryology that mm -hmm. he was well known. And his best known work was the embryological development of the armadillo with the four quadruplets. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, uh, Patterson was also responsible for hiring Muller to come to the University of Texas, which he was very proud of having done. In any case, Muller did his great radiation work there, and Patterson was responsible for, for getting the facilities for Muller to do his work. Uh, he, they, they had a room set aside for Drosophila work, and it was cooled, which makes a big difference in Austin, Texas. And in, a, in many ways, Muller owes a great deal to Patterson for just the administrative ways of getting him to a chance to work. So the artificial transmutation of the gene experiments were all done? They're all done Austin. there in Texas, yes. And uh, uh, Muller's influence was so great that they all started working on Drosophila, Painter and, and Patterson and, and then Stone, who was his student. So now it's 1941. You're teaching at Dartmouth. Uh, what are you teaching? I was teaching elementary biology, the laboratories, and then, of course, in genetics in the spring. And of course, during that year, the United States got involved in the war. Then Dartmouth became a V-12 unit and was essentially taken over by the Navy. And I taught all manner of things. I taught parasitology, also taught hematology because that was simply the part of the course. I taught genetics, but not very often because there was no demand for genetics during the war. I also taught math courses. Uh, taught quite a number of different math courses. So I spent the war years <coughs> mostly just uh, teaching in the, in the, for the Navy. You compiled one of the most famous statistical charts in the history of statistics, I think. Was it in connection with teaching statistics? Yes, it was. In fact, the, uh, uh, when I, the, the first course the medical students at Dartmouth took was, was statistics. And I could uh, see disappointment written over the faces of the students to come in here and said, at last we're going to see the human body and learn what pills are. And then we have to learn the chi-square distribution. But in the course of this, I wanted to show the chi-square in a graphical form. So I, I decided to prepare a chart, uh, which is this. 
And what I was pleased to be able to do was to uh, find a transformation of scale that made these lines straight. So, uh, and um, many of the values I could get, I could get out of the literature, but not all of them. So I had to com compute a few points. And it took me all afternoon to compute one of these. I had a slowly converging series uh, for chi-square and a hand-operated calculating machine. I believe it was electric, but it was a calculator, not a computer. And uh, it, it took hours to get just a few points on this graph. And I was very happy then to have it a linear transformation that made it not necessary to compute very many. And then I discovered that by turning the graph upside down, I could put the t-chart on, on the same graph. Um, there's no doubt, but this is far and away my most popular publication. I've had more requests for a reprint of this over the, well, it was in 1945, I guess, when this was published, over the period of, over the period of years since that since Where was that time. it published? It was purposed in the Journal of the American Statistical Association. You wrote another famous paper uh, I, at that time. Right. I only wrote two papers, three papers, but <laughs> two that I'll call famous uh, while I was at Dartmouth. The other was on hybrid vigor heterosis. And the, the origins of that story uh, is uh, perhaps interesting, too, because this was, the war had not by this time stopped. So this was in 1946. And I decided I needed to know more statistics. So I enrolled in a summer course in statistics at North Carolina State in Raleigh. And the star attraction was R.A. Fisher. Uh, so I took this series of courses and, and talked with Fisher. And at that time, heterosis and especially overdominance was in the air, and I had an idea. The, the idea essentially amounts to what Haldane had long since discovered, but I didn't know that and worked this out. Showed it to Fisher. He rather liked the idea. In fact, he sort of used it later on in his own, uh, own writing. Maybe I should take this opportunity to say how I really got well acquainted with Fisher, too. Yes, please. Uh, one evening, Fisher gave a lecture, and it was on the RH factor. And at that time, the three locus idea that Fisher had was new. And he presented it in the evening lecture. And it was new to me, too. Uh, so I was very excited by this. And uh, after the lecture was over, there were a couple of questions on statistics. And it was clear enough that Fisher didn't want those. And so I asked some questions about genetics. And it was clear that's what he did want. So uh, he proceeded to talk more about this. And then we got together after the lecture. And he suggested having a drink, or maybe I did. Anyhow, we walked across the street to a bar and sat down and uh, ordered, uh, ordered beer first. And they were run out. they'd run out. These were the days of wartime shortages. And they didn't have any wine either. But they did have champagne. So we ordered a bottle of, of champagne. And then uh, we were just about to uncork it when the waiter came and said that North Carolina law doesn't permit you to drink champagne in, the, in this public occasion, whatever it is. Uh, so we corked the bottle back up took it back up to my dormitory room and drank this champagne. And so we had a good two hours of talk. And uh, I don't know whether I became more garrulous or not, but Fisher certainly did <laughs> after, after a bit of champagne. And that was the beginning of our uh, a long and really very happy acquaintance. Would you say a little more about the conceptual content of the overdominance and heterosis paper and also yeah. bring that story up to date? Yes, well, yes. I, I, and I had a chance to bring it up to date. Uh, in 1950, there was a conference in uh, Ames, Ames, Iowa, on heterosis. And I argued then that uh, uh, with um, ordinary mutation selection balance, the mutation rate wasn't enough to permit the, uh, by covering up hidden recessives, wasn't enough to permit the high yield that comes from hybrid corn. And so, that, that, so I therefore favored overdominance as the explanation for it, and wrote this in the 1948 paper while I was still at Dartmouth, and then elaborated on it in 1950. Shortly after that, it became clear that partial dominance was the rule rather than the exception, and that doubled everything. And the mutation rates were higher than I had previously assumed. So my arguments really essentially had fallen flat. And meanwhile, there were other evidence against, against overdominance. So over the course of the next five or 10 years, I changed my mind on, on this subject. Uh, didn't do much with it until the summer of 1997 when uh, this Mexican consortium uh, had a meeting in Mexico City. 
and I was invited to give a talk with the same title that I'd given in 1950, 47 years earlier. Uh, and so I, I gave the same title, but with a different conclusion. <laughs> you have always been fascinated with the fundamental theorem of natural selection. Yes, I have, uh, yes. You want to reflect on that for a bit, why, well, why you it, find it it's, so interesting? It's been controversial, and, and various people have tried to say what Fisher really meant. Uh, Fisher, is, as usual, is elegant and as usual is obscure, so it's not quite clear what Fisher had in mind. Um, and many people have shown that it isn't exact, given linkage and epistasis and the usual complications of genetics, and have uh, taken pains to point out that it's, it's non-generality or non-exactness. Other people, such as Ewan's, have tried to take special cases of this where it is correct and say that this is what Fisher really meant. Uh, I haven't written much about this, but I've talked a lot about it. But my own view about this is that I don't care too much about whether it's really exact or not. That that it says it it, it tells us a lot about the way evolution works, and I don't have to worry about whether it's exact in the case of certain kinds of epistasis. Tom Nagalaki and I worked out for a continuous model once uh, uh, the ray at which the rate at which a uh, trait that's correlated with fitness would change. And we did this in excruciating detail. Uh, but actually, it seemed to me that in, that in many ways, Fisher captured the es es essence of the problem by eliding over details rather than mm -hmm. emphasizing them. So that's sort of my view of the fundamental theorem. And I think it's proper to call it a fundamental theorem, although that's here and there disputed. It's in the Camus certainly respected Fisher's work. I heard him say one time that uh, <clears throat> that he could improve on Haldane's work and he could improve on Wright's work, but he couldn't improve on Fisher's work. That's quite a compliment. Mm -hmm. He once described Fisher's book as a book you ought not to read unless you've read it before. <laughs> That's a good description of it. <laughs> I, I've reread the book several times, and each time there are things in there that I didn't uh, didn't recognize. Uh, and I told you how I met Fisher over a, over a bottle of champagne. Uh, after, after that, I saw him many times because Fisher's daughter lived in Madison. And he visited her about twice a year. And when he came to Madison, he would come by. And we, we had visits. We saved problems for him. I remember one on one occasion uh, that had something to do with the degrees of freedom in the Poisson problem. And uh, we didn't know how to deal with it. And so I asked Fisher about it. He said, yes. He'd written a paper on that subject. And he said, it's such and such a volume and page number in biometrics. So we had the copy available. So I got it and brought it up. And Fisher proceeded to read the article to us. And uh, as he would go along, every once in a while, he would say, by Jove, that's good, isn't it? <laughs> go, on and, go on and read some more. And while you were in Dartmouth, you, you, you saw a lot of Muller. Yes, I did. Uh, he was, he was teaching at Amherst College at that time. He had previously been to Russia, as I said earlier. He got out of Russia by uh, <clears throat> participating, you might say, in the Spanish Revolution that was going on at that time. That enabled him to leave Russia and not look too bad from the Russians' standpoint. Uh, Muller told me that uh, once, rather interesting, he said he argued that uh, if Lysenkoism, in other words, Lamarckian inheritance were correct, there would be very little hope for a proletariat revolution because these people had lived in bad environments for so long that they had very little hope. And he tried that argument on Lysenko. <laughs> Got nowhere, of course. <laughs> By this time, he was thoroughly disillusioned with Lysenko. But he was afraid that if he denounced Lysenko too loudly, it would go hard on his Russian friends. Actually, it went hard on them anyhow, mm -hmm. I think, so it didn't make much difference. But he went to uh, the Spanish War for a while and then moved to uh, Edinburgh was there for a short period of time, and then finally came to the United States and had a temporary position at Amherst College. Well, he had difficulty getting employed because of He's, his red connection. He certainly did. He had, uh, I don't, uh, while he was in Amherst, he knew it was a temporary position. So he was looking for jobs, and uh, he told me once, he said that he was turned down for one position for being uh, too, too leftist for his communist affiliations. I don't think he was ever a member of the party, but mm -hmm. he certainly went to Russia. But meanwhile, after he came back here, he started denouncing Lysenko. So the leftist group didn't want him either because they thought he was a fascist. And he, uh, he told me, he said, well, at least one thing's true. I can't be both. 
And uh, actually, it was just a few years, months later after I'd been talking to him, that he was offered the job at uh, University of Indiana and then got the Nobel Prize a few weeks later. I talked with the department chairman at Indiana who had hired Muller and congratulated him on doing this. It was brokered, incidentally, by Warren Weaver of the Rockefeller oh, yes, Foundation, yes. who was helping people like Muller find positions. Being at Dartmouth was also important for your family life. You want to, would you say a few words about that? Yes. Uh, my wife, Ann, uh, we met in, in Austin while I was still a student, and she was a student there, too. And we got married in the uh, summer of 1941 and then moved together to, uh, to Hanover, to, where I took the job at Dartmouth College. And then we had three children, all born in Hanover while well, during, those, during those years. Um, I, was, I was very happy teaching at Dartmouth College. And after the war was over, I stopped teaching math and parasitology and taught mainly uh, embryology, uh, cytology, genetics, anatomy, but anyhow, all regular biology courses. And I liked that. I liked to teach. And I think I might have been perfectly happy staying at a teaching institution, which Dartmouth was at that time. It's changed, it's changed since. But about 1946 and 47, I began to wonder whether I might really like a, an opportunity to do more research. And so I decided if the chance came to move to the big leagues, I would, I would do it. And the way this worked out <clears throat> was I decided to go to the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium in the summer of 1947. And it was on nucleic acids. I decided uh, maybe nucleic acids were going to be important and I should learn something about them. Uh, and I did. But the most memorable thing about this was meeting Joshua Lederberg. He had only recently discovered recombination in bacteria. And he gave an evening lecture. He went on and on for possibly two or three hours. It seemed like a very long time, although I was absorbed by it and loved every minute of it. And after it was over, uh, I asked a question that, it was that he regarded as perceptive, so did I, uh, as, as to what kind of assumption he was making about interference when he, when he did his crossovers. And uh, that got us started in the discussion, which went on that night and then continued through the rest of the Cold Spring Harbor meetings. So we had a number of talks about just recombination and how one could study it. And I'd, I understood what he was doing and not sure that everybody in the audience did, but uh, we Anyhow, put us, it started us off as, a, as an acquaintance with each other. He was going to, to Wisconsin at that time. And although I have no direct evidence one way or the other, I suspect the reason I was finally offered a position in Wisconsin was because of, uh, of Joshua, who suggested me for the, for oh, the did place. Did the offer come out of the blue? Yes, it did. And the position I took was half time in genetics and half time in zoology. And I was there as a replacement for Ray Owen who had been there and been very popular and was very much missed. And I was to take his place. And I heard a great deal about Ray Owen the first two or three years that I was there. Still would if he were, uh, but I didn't know him at the time. Of course, later I've gotten acquainted with him and we're the closest of, of friends now. <clears throat> I was very happy to be his successor. It was a remarkable group of geneticists and biologists at Madison at that time and after. It was impressive. There was R.A. Brink, who was just starting to work on transposable elements at that time. Barbara McClinic had already sort of opened the field up. <clears throat> there was Cooper, who was doing cytogenetics, and Joshua Lederberg, who was revolutionizing genetics in a sense by discovering uh, ways of studying microorganisms. One of the nicest pieces of work that came out of that, of that place was Ray Owen's discovery of in twin calves that the two calves could have different blood groups and not uh, have any transfusion reactions between the blood. So that, in a way that was, the, uh, that was the opening up of the whole subject of immune tolerance. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> there was an animal breeding group which I was interested in because they were sort of followers of Sewell Wright. Mm -hmm. And then while I was there, we brought Sewell Wright to Wisconsin. That's a good story. And when was that? That was in uh, the mid-50s. Wright was ready to retire from the University of Chicago at age 65, and Wisconsin retirement age was 70. So he could come five more years on the Wisconsin faculty. I think many people in Chicago have kicked themselves for not holding on to him. 
anyhow, he came to Wisconsin for, the, for those five years. It's the biggest bargain any university ever got because Wisconsin never did pay him a full salary. They paid only the difference between uh, what he would have gotten from his retirement annuity and what the regular faculty salary would have been. And uh, that was for five years. Then he retired to age 70 for the 72nd time and then worked till age 98. We had already made plans for a 100th birthday celebration and he was looking forward to it. Uh, and, uh, and he was in good health when he died. Uh, he was, uh, his eyesight was bad. He had a, um, <clears throat> he, he loved to walk. And he went for a walk and, 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 and didn't see an icy spot and slipped and fell and died as a result of a hip, hip fracture, which uh, led to an embolism. I'll tell you a couple of anecdotes about Wright that tells you a little about the man. He was an exceedingly generous, kindly person. He started out to write uh, this what's now his famous four-volume set on the population genetics. And he began to write that after he'd been to Wisconsin for several years. I don't know, how, he must have been 75 or maybe even close to 80 by the time he started this and worked on it for the next several years. <clears throat> I remember that the book got bigger and bigger and the third volume uh, got so big that they couldn't put it in one volume, so he wanted to change it to three and four the University of Chicago Press didn't want to do this. They thought, they thought it was getting too big. And I got a call at the time from the editor of the University of Chicago Press asking me if I would persuade Wright to cut down this last volume so it, so it gets, that's two volumes, so they can make it into one. Uh, the, I told him that I'd never been able to persuade Wright to do something he didn't want to do, and I wasn't able to do it now, it wouldn't. What made this book great was its completeness and they should be happy to have it expanded. And I remember vividly what the editor said. That, uh, I said it would bring prestige to the University of Chicago Press. The editor said, we have all the prestige we want. We, we need some bestsellers <laughs> to balance the budget. Actually, it turned out to be a bestseller. I don't know how many people read all four volumes, possibly no one, but at least uh, it maybe is the most widely bought and least widely read set of books in the history of publishing. The other thing about Wright I want to tell you while I'm here talking about him, is about his generosity. When he was writing these books, he had a subsidy from the National Science Foundation that paid him a small honorarium. And during the course of this, uh, the National Science Foundation had an inflationary adjustment of the pay. So I got a call from the operating officer at the National Science Foundation saying that they'd raise Wright's salary. So I went down to tell him about it, and Wright gave a most amazing response. He said that, uh, he said, I've uh, done a very careful calculation, and my productivity is decreasing at exactly the same rate as the value of the dollar, and I'm not worth any more. <laughs> and he never did accept that, that increase. <clears throat> so moving to Wisconsin launched your research career. And it, yes, it certainly did. Uh, did you start with Drosophila immediately? Yes, I did. I started with Drosophila. Worked on the um, polygenic inheritance of DDT resistance for a while. The work is not particularly memorable. Uh, but I did do one thing. I, I did use what would now be called QTL mapping. I used uh, markers to locate the resistance genes on the chromosome. Didn't work too well because the markers themselves had viability and resistance effects, but I did locate a few, a few genes this way, and uh, the idea certainly was good. All we needed were good molecular markers in those days to have done a better job. While this work was going on, Newton Morton came as a graduate student, and I'm happy to say it was a sheer delight. He, he was exceedingly good as a student and self-motivated, uh, and he did an, uh, a nice master's thesis that later I carried on quite a bit further, but it was really a joint effort on our part. And that had to do with effective population number and measuring that in an uh, in experimental organism. I realized then that there are different ways of defining effective population number. Right had only one, but I, that it depends on whether you define it in terms of variance or in terms of inbreeding, and these sometimes lead to rather different results. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, wrote a theoretical paper on this particular subject. And then Newton did most of the experiments. He did them very quickly, actually, and got a master's degree. 
then uh, <clears throat> he was really interested in human genetics. And uh, so I wanted to arrange things so he could work in human genetics. And by at that time, the uh, Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission was just getting underway in Japan with Jim Neal directing the genetic parts of it. So I thought this was ideal, that Newton could go to work with Neil and uh, work with human genetics, which he wanted. While he was in Japan, <coughs> he wrote a note to me and said that he had uh, discovered a very gifted mathematical geneticist named Kimura and sent me some of his reprints, which I looked at and found I was very impressed by them, actually. What stage was Kimura in his career at that time? He had a master's degree, but he was already an employee at the Mishima Genetics Institute in, in Japan. Uh, <clears throat> Martin came back, and then uh, a year or two later, it's a remarkable story, uh, I, the Genetic Society of America met in Madison that year, and I encountered a Japanese in the meeting room who clearly was lost, and so I asked if I could help him find his way, and I did. It turned out his name was Kimura, and uh, I recognized the name for having read these papers. And probably the not only half a, probably not a half a dozen people in the United States had ever heard of Kimura, but I had, and uh, he had brought with him a manuscript for uh, um, pseudo random drift, you might say, caused by fluctuation in, pop in population size. Um, he had written it on a ship as he crossed the, as he crossed Pacific, and I helped him work it out in the sense of of straightening out the English. Kimura's English was pretty primitive at that, at that time. He had come to the United States to work with, uh, he had hoped to work with Wright. And Wright said he was retiring, he wasn't taking any more students. So he, he'd had this one visit in Madison and I did, I'd evinced a great deal of interest in his work and helped him with writing his paper. And it was eventually published in Genetics. So about Christmas time he wrote and asked if he could come and be my student. And I was a little bit um, reticent about this because I knew I couldn't teach Kimura any, any mathematics. Uh, but I also knew that Wright was planning to come. And that was a good enough reason to have Kimura come. So I accepted him as a student. And he came to Madison then. And um, the rest of it, you might say, is history. Mm -hmm. While still a graduate student, he worked out the whole sequence of the stochastic process from. Uh, uh, under random drift, and, and then uh, many, many more things. Uh, a beautiful thing about Kimura's work, he was very, very gifted at handing, handling the kinds of partial differential equations, the Kolmogorov equations, and applying them to genetic situations. He did this more creatively, I think, than anybody else ever did. <clears throat> but the nice thing about this is that later on, when he developed the neutral theory, the mathematics was all, already and very few people have this great privilege of doing something early in life and then having later on it turned out to be of great, <coughs> great value for what they were doing later. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, Morton and Kimura both the students simultaneously at the, same time. at the same time. And they were both astonishingly good, as everybody knows nowadays. And it got me off to a good start. Not very many beginning graduate instructors have two students like that. Did Mahler spend some time? There at about this time, because there's a very famous paper by Morton, Crow, and Muller that I'd like you to say a few words. Yes, about. well, uh, Muller was not there at the time, but I was seeing Muller once in a while because the what was called the Bear Committee, Biological Effects of Atomic Radiation, and that group was meeting, and Muller was a member of it, and so was I, <clears throat> and I played a a larger role in that than one might have otherwise. The chairman of this committee was Warren Weaver. He invented the word molecular biology, I'm told, and he was certainly foresighted in sending Rockefeller funds into the support of molecular biology, what's now called molecular biology. He supported the Caltech program with Beadle and, uh, and uh, Pauling. And the committee immediately fell into two factions, one led by Muller and one led by Wright, that had to do with whether to use Muller's idea of genetic load or not which Wright thought was simplistic, and Muller thought was the way to approach this problem. And my role in this uh, was essentially to tutor Warren Weaver. <laughs> and he was a mathematician and, of course, very gifted.
but I understood Wright's work, and at the same time was somewhat sympathetic with Muller's view, and so I could, uh, I could translate this. And uh, eventually the report was written with the disagreement between Wright and Muller sort of paved over. In the course of this, I realized that one could use inbreeding data to uh, measure indirectly the human mutation rate. And uh, Muller and Morton, I mean, had essentially arrived at the same thing. We talked together about it and, uh, and had pretty well worked out some of this. And then I discovered that Muller had had the same idea. So Muller said, well, why don't th the three of us just write this paper together, uh, which we did. I, I, uh, I wanted to say things my way in this paper, so I quickly came home, wrote the manuscript, and sent it to Muller for approval. He made a few changes, but not very much. But, so most of that is in my words, together with a lot of help from Newton Morton, of course. And uh, I've been very happy about that, about so that, that paper. It might mm -hmm. be worthwhile to say, if, to, to, to <coughs> say in ordinary English what a genetic load is and why it's important. Well, in, in, this, uh, in this context, uh, the mutation load is, is the amount by which the population fitness or whatever else you want to measure is reduced as a result of recurrent mutation. And then there can be loads because of uh, heterosis, for example, where the load is caused by segregating homozygotes, or there can be a load caused by epistasis, and so on for many other possibilities. But this did get me started thinking about this, and, and, I, and, and I worked out the quantitative way to uh, assess or measure or define a genetic load, which is stuck, I think, and is now the sort of the standard way of discussing the question. There was at the time, or at least in the mid-60s, maybe a little earlier, a flurry of papers criticizing the concept by C.C. C. Lee and Dobzhansky and yes. others. Do you want to comment on yes, that I, controversy I, I, at all? In current thinking, I think probably I was essentially right, but then uh, the, that the, the, the uh, <coughs> There's a question about whether genetic load measures what you really want to measure or not. But what, if you define it correctly and measure it correctly, it's measuring that particular, mm -hmm. that particular quantity. Uh, the, the controversy really arose because of Dobzhansky. Dobzhansky had the idea of just uh, ubiquitous heterosis, that almost every locus was heterotic. <clears throat> and it seemed to me and to several others at the time that that would have just imposed an unnecessarily large load on the population. There would be too many segregating homozygotes. We didn't think of a very large number of alleles which might have helped solve that particular problem. But this led then to a, to a disagreement between uh, Dobzhansky and me. Eventually the, the uh, controversies more or less died down for lack of interest rather than a, really a solution to it. And, uh, and the neutral work of Kimura came in about that time and more or less replaced the old argument as the basis for for polemics. Later on, incidentally, uh, I uh, had a chance to review an, a new edition of Dobzhansky's book. And uh, <clears throat> Dobzhansky was very much a hero of mine when I was a graduate student. His first book on uh, genetics of natural populations came out during that time. And I was very much impressed by it. And, and he was my hero during a very long period of time, except those three or four years where we were, where we were at odds with each other. <laughs> but later on in life, I reviewed his book favorably and got back a very sweet letter from him. Of, so all ended well. Related to this, uh, to the genetic load uh, <clears throat> controversy, is the notion of uh, opportunity for selection. Yes. Which you also invented. I invented that. What, what got you thinking about that, measuring the opportunity for selection? <laughs> well, I went to Michigan with Newton Morton to uh, some kind of a meeting, and we drove back together. And we were talking about uh, how to uh, assess variability in the population and, um, and how much opportunity there is for selection by how much additive variance there is in the population. <clears throat> and it occurred to me as, as we were driving that there was a way of, of measuring this. Uh, so then when I got home, I, I worked it out. There wasn't much to work out, actually. Um, it just, it's just simply the ratio of the variance to the mean, to the square of the mean. And so I worked this out. Uh, some people said it wasn't, it wasn't anything new, and, and, and they were quite right. It, it's essentially a discrete version of Fisher's fundamental theorem of natural selection. But it caught on, anyhow. Maybe, I think mainly for being simple. 
and a few people at the University of Chicago started uh, using it as a way of uh, assessing the variability in populations. But you also did some Drosophila experiments to Yes, we did some. They estimated, estimated it empirically, yeah. And I used some human data to estimate it empirically, too. <clears throat> this is about the time Horizomy came. Yes. Uh, and, and meiotic drive. Was right, so I'll, I'll tell you that story, oh, too. Yes, please. Uh, when Kimura left, he'd had a very happy graduate experience. Uh, Madison must have just seemed like Mecca to him because uh, it came just after the war was over. He'd, he had never, he was too young to be in the army, but he had suffered for lack of food, as did it virtually everyone in Japan. And he said even the, the post-war years were even worse than the war years from the food supply. And everybody was very, very poor. And when he came to this country and uh, an abundance of almost everything that he wanted, he said it just seemed almost too nice to be, to be true. But it was also an intellectually happy time for him. He did some of his very best work there, and, and he had a sympathetic appreciation, by me especially, but also by Wright. Uh, Wright didn't fully understand his work and wasn't sympathetic with all of it, but uh, he respected it greatly. And I'll mention one thing. At the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, of in the mid-50s. Kimura gave a paper there, and nobody understood it for two good reasons. One is the mathematics was, was difficult, but second, Kimura's English was hard to understand. And I remember that after the talk was over, there was one question asked which uh, made it very clear that the questioner hadn't understood one thing about what Kimura had been saying. And then finally, uh, <clears throat> Wright got up and said uh, that uh, only those people who had tried to solve problems like this and been unable to could fully appreciate the depth of, of Kimura's work. My. That's a very generous thing to say. Mm -hmm. And it, I'm sure it had a lot to do with establishing Kimura's instant recognition as mm -hmm. somebody to take seriously. <clears throat> well, when Kimura left after finishing graduate school, <clears throat> he said it was such a happy time that he had found a successor. And of course, the uh, reputation of Japan is at stake here if he didn't find a good successor, so he found a good one. And this was Hirazumi, Yurichiro Hirazumi, who, whom Kimura recommended as his successor. So uh, Hirazumi came to Madison, <coughs> and I was interested at that time in uh, assessing the amount of um, hidden variability in natural populations, and Hirazumi started to do a thesis on that. And then in the course of these experiments that involved some matings between flies that were white. He reported one day to me that there was one of his cultures that instead of showing the regular 50-50 Mendelian segregation, showed essentially 100% of the wild type. I thought there was just a mistake of some sort. It, there were a lot of <laughs> ways in which this could have happened accidentally. Uh, but uh, he repeated it and meanwhile found one or two more strains with the same property. So it became clear that this was real and that he had, in fact, found a good example of what's now called meiotic drive. In fact, it was called meiotic drive at the, at the time, too, because uh, Sandler and Novitsky had written a theoretical paper <coughs> suggesting that such things as this might happen, and they had an example or two where it did. Uh, it's a great coincidence. I had reviewed a paper by him and, uh, and Novitsky, and I remember that uh, I found a mistake in it and wrote to Novitsky about it. And it impressed him very much because he, he wrote back and said that Sturdivant and Stadler had both read that paper and neither of them found that mistake. So it uh, immediately gave me a good reputation with Novitsky and therefore indirectly with Sandler. Well, Sandler decided he'd like to come to Madison and work as a postdoc with me and I was very happy to have him. So he had, and he had his own fellowship which he'd gotten uh, so he came to Madison, and of course the rest of it's a beautiful story that yes. uh, Sandler and uh, Horizon made a great research team and did all the early work in establishing segregation distortion. Uh, while we're talking and while you're here though, I'll mention that the clinching evidence for this being due to sperm dysfunction was an experiment that you did as a, as a thesis by uh, taking advantage of the fact that under some circumstances, uh, the number of sperm can be limiting. The flies have mated many times, are very young, and therefore, the, uh, <clears throat> if this was due to uh, 
dysfunction of half of the, half of the sperm. If sperm were limiting, then only half as many offspring would be produced. And you did the experiment. You had horizon me together in this case that established that point. So it's, it's a nice piece of uh, sewing up of that particular study. In all fairness, I have to give Horizon credit for, for having the courage to set up the experiment because on the face of it, you wouldn't think it would work. He had the <coughs> attitude you never knew whether an experiment would work or not unless you set it up. He, he was absolutely indefatigable in, in work and, and would undertake a kind of experiments that other people didn't want to do. He uh, set up these original experiments, I, I believe I'm right, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to estimate the average degree of dominance of recessive lethals. Is right. That right? Mm -hmm. uh, you want to talk about that whole area of research? I, I, we did quite a number of different kind of experiments in which flies from nature were brought in, made homozygous so that whatever recessive genes there were expressed, and then uh, try to ask how what the effect of these were and try to infer uh, what the time that the mutant would persist in the population before it being eliminated. And the upshot of all these is that, uh, that there's very strong evidence for partial dominance, that there's hardly ever such a thing as a completely recessive, recessive gene. And uh, uh, one of the things that Terasby did was measure the average dominance of uh, heterozygous expression of, of lethal genes that gotten under different kind of circumstances. And he went ahead and wrote a thesis on this subject, which is perfectly good, except it had been eclipsed by this much uh, more exciting work on the, on the meiotic drive. Although this issue of, of partial dominance of recessive lethals was itself pretty controversial. It was at, at that time. time. Mm -hmm. Bruce Wallace had done yes, some radiation correct. experiments that suggested that the radiation was actually producing heterotic effects. Uh, these, were, these were small and the numbers were enormous, and I don't think we still know the full explanation. So Kamara <coughs> had gone back to <coughs> Japan, but you continued working with him on various subjects. Uh, your, your paper on asexual versus sexual reproduction, was that in collaboration with him in Japan? It, he was in Madison, actually, okay. at the time. He came back and visited Madison again uh, once, twice, one, but once for a fairly extended period. And during that time, we wrote several papers together. One was about uh, essentially elaborating Muller's idea about the value of sexual reproduction. Uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, one of the things we did at that time, which I thought was nicest, nice, <laughs> was um, showing that, the, uh, uh, that a rapid decrease in, uh, that avoiding, um, avoiding mating between close relatives uh, was the way to immediately prevent loss of heterozygosis, but asymptotically or in the long run, it wasn't the best. And we found some mating systems that uh, changed more rapidly at first, but were much slower at the end of the process. We talked about this, and he did the algebra and showed it to me. And I said, well, you can't be right, because uh, the most, most conservative mating system you could do is mate the least related individuals. And, but I took it home that night, worked it out for myself, and sure enough, Kimura was right. So the next day, I went in, perhaps with Kimura, I've forgotten, uh, to tell Wright about this, and he said, well, it can't be right because <laughs> mating least related individuals is the best way to prevent uh, loss of heterozygosity. But then he worked it out for himself and realized that Kimura had been right all along. So we wrote a paper on this subject. This one I took a great deal of satisfaction in. Did you know Alan Robertson? No, Alan. I admired him enormously. The, uh, he, I, I thought that just time and again he cut through the, to the quick, and, and uh, in fact, uh, there are two or three times, in, in connection with this um, maximum of avoidance of inbreeding that I mentioned a while ago, uh, Moto and Kimura and I worked this out all right, uh, but I didn't see the, the big general picture that, uh, that uh, Alan finally saw. He, uh, he saw clearly what I'd seen through a glass darkly and saw the neat generalization to this about whether the inbreeding gets ahead of the, of the random drift or not. The other thing that grew out of um, associated with Kimura at about that time was developing what's now called the infinite allele model. Uh, I was aware then that uh, <clears throat> the number of wild that the number of possible allelic states must be very large. Part of the evidence came from bacteria, and part of it from molecular knowledge of the times. And so uh, uh, he and I wrote an article in which I did the 
biology, and he did the math as usual, uh, and described what's now called the infinite allele model, grammatically, the infinite number of alleles model, uh, which is formed, formed in many ways the basis for his, uh, his neutral theory. But the inception of this aspect of it, not the theory itself, uh, came while, we, while the two of us were working together in Madison. Now, I, I haven't checked, but that may be your most widely cited paper very, other than chi squared and t. It might very well be. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> test, pervasive checked either. in modern population yeah. genetics. This succession of Japanese students naming their successors has gone on through quite a large series. After Hirazumi was Maruyama, who was a very gifted mathematician and did some very nice work in mathematical genetics, both in Madison and, and after he went back to Japan. He died, I'm sorry to say, very, very young from a heart attack. Uh, after him came uh, Mukai, Terumi Mukai. Mukai had done some experiments in Japan that attempted to measure the polygenic mutation rate by the rate of accumulation of genetic damage over a large number of generations in which a uh, chromosome being tested was held in heterozygous condition for generation after generation. And the uh, estimate that he got of the mutation rate seemed too high. He came to my lab and repeated the experiments, and he got the same results again. And then still later, uh, another Japanese, uh, Omi Onishi, did something very similar, and again, roughly parallel results. He, at the same time, did some uh, uh, mutagenesis studies, too, at the same, along with it. Uh, and for a while, those were simply accepted by everybody, Mukai's estimates. But lately, there's been revisionism. And different people have analyzed his data and reached different conclusions and done other experiments and reached different conclusions. And I say right now, I just don't know. Yeah. The Drosophila mutation rate, I think, is probably not as high as, uh, as Mukai thought, and as I thought, too, because of, of his work. Had some wonderful undergraduates, too, like Joe Felsenstein. That's right. <laughs> uh, Joe was great. I, I met him as, a, as an honor student and gave this group of students a talk one evening and they were all very bright, being honor students, but the one was conspicuously brighter than the others, and that was Joe. And so I, I latched on to him. I didn't have to work very hard because he was wanting to work with me too, so it, it was a happy time. But I think on the whole, I've, uh, I've uh, been conspicuously successful with, with graduate students. I've had some extraordinarily good ones, including one that's sitting right here. Could you talk a bit about Charlie Cotterman? Yes. And his role in your career? He's a remarkable character. Uh, I was aware of his thesis. It's probably the most widely read unpublished thesis in genetics. It was in which he did many very neat things, but the, <coughs> the most important and the most lasting of those is defining inbreeding by identity by descent, the way that uh, Malico did. But actually, Cotterman was first. But it was largely ignored because it was in an unpublished thesis. But anyhow, it's a great idea. I am happy about one thing, incidentally, that uh, I didn't make any intellectual contribution to this subject, but, uh, but I did invent the words. I, I invented the word identity by descent. So, and now it's, of course, part of, part of the standard language. He came to Madison, I've forgotten what year, uh, and I was very glad to have him. I, have him. I knew he was a genius. He taught a course. Uh, maybe you took it. Yes. Uh, and the uh, uh, made a tremendous impact on the small number of people who did it. And uh, he certainly was the com most complete example of a logical thinker that uh, that I know. In my notes is the word isonomy. Yes. And it reminded me of Charlie. This has a history. Uh, while I was still at Dartmouth and invited Muller to come up there and give a uh, lecture. He lectured away on, on, forgotten about what it was now, but I remember one thing he said. He said that the person's name is linked to the Y chromosome. I remember the exact words. And they went on to be able to use that to study such things as migration and inbreeding. Uh, and uh, I didn't think much more about it. And then several years later, I, I had a student named Arthur Mange who was studying the heterites. And I thought maybe we could use <coughs> the frequency with which people with the same name married as a measure of amount of consanguinity in the population. Cotterman suggested we should call it isonomy, and I discovered a, a relationship between the inbreeding coefficient and the probability of having the same name as a factor of four, is what it amounts to. And uh, 
showed that this is true under fairly general kinds of matings, but it's not always true. And Cotterman found out that if you take four people, there are, I believe, 17 possible relationships among these, of which only four of them obey the isonomy rule. <laughs> and so uh, I had written the paper by this time, and I wanted him to co-author it with me, but he wasn't satisfied with it. And so I finally went ahead on my own. But it really, a, a lot of the credit for this should go to Kahneman. After I'd written this article with Arthur Mange, I wrote to Muller and said that since this idea in the first place came from him, I want to know how best to acknowledge it. Or maybe he wanted to co-author it. And he wrote back and said he never heard of any such thing. So uh, apparently he tossed that idea off on the spur of the moment at the Dartmouth lecture and, uh, and forgot it. And I have one, I can make one claim to fame here that Muller had a great reputation for, for uh, upholding his own priority, and he was very assertive about it. I may be the only person in the world who's had a reverse <laughs> priority <laughs> dispute with Muller. <coughs> in any case, the isonomies turned out to be quite a useful trick. And uh, some years ago, I told somebody that this is going to work very well until somebody finds markers on the Y chromosome, in which case the technique will become extinct. Mm -hmm. And I think that's happening. That's, that's how oh, did the P-transposable element come into your life? It came in by way of Bill Engels. At first he was a graduate student with um, Carter Denniston. And then he, uh, and while he was still a graduate student, he found these rather puzzling hybrid cisgenesis effects and changed the problem he was working on to work on this. And then after he graduated, I, I, I had a postdoctoral fellowship that I could get him into. and. Uh, well, essentially, this is the story of Engels. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he discovered for himself what had been independently discovered by Sved and uh, Margaret Kidwell. And uh, I've made very little contribution to this, uh, except as a, as a uh, sounding board, tabula rasa, uh, or a reflecting board for him to talk about his ideas for. But I kept up with it all the time. And uh, it's been quite impressive what's been done with this, with this factor. You used your uh, understanding of population genetics to develop some of the most, uh, the earliest indirect measures of human mutation rates. Is that right? Yes, I did, and uh, and I'm still doing it somewhat. Uh, I'm I'm now, uh, i now that I'm retired, I don't have a lab anymore, and so what I work with are other people's data. Mm -hmm. But I have been following the literature on the human mutation rates, some direct, some indirect, uh, and later on Peter Keatley came along and did the right thing, really, which is to use the, this essentially the same idea, but with proteins, mm -hmm. where, it did yield, where it did yield an estimate. It's interesting to me that human genetics developed in, the, in England before it developed in this country, or before it developed very far. Mm -hmm. And I think it was mainly because uh, the chief population geneticist in this country, Wright, really didn't take much interest in human genetics. And about the only human geneticist back when I was a graduate student was Snyder. And he was fine, but but there. On the other hand, in in Britain, they had these real powerhouses of Fisher and Haldane, mm -hmm. who did human studies, and then Penrose, who maybe more than any other single one was influential in getting human genetics going in Britain. I think human genetics in this country and the Human Genetics Society was instigated mainly by Muller. He he took an interest in it, and he was the first first president of the of the society. And it was a decision made, I've forgotten what year it would have been, maybe 48, 49, something along in there, to, to start a separate American genetics, American Society of Human Genetics. Uh, you were also well known at Madison as one of the premier teachers in the genetics department. Could you talk a little bit about what you taught while you were at Madison? From 1948 till my retirement in 86, I taught genetics essentially every, every year during that time. Had a large number of students, of course, and I hardly go to any public gathering without encountering one or more uh, former students. And in, in enjoyed lecturing, and uh, I don't know whether I worked especially hard at it, but I worked hard enough to give good lectures anyhow. And I did start the innovation of handing out my lecture material so students uh, wouldn't have to spend all the time scribbling notes. That started out as just mimeograph handouts. Finally developed into a, into a book. Cross yes. Notes. Right. What edition is that in now? It's in its eighth edition. Wow. I, I don't dare try to bring it up to date. I'd get 
uh, it would have to be 10 times as large, and molecular biology has just taken off, of course. Uh, it's, uh, the classical genetics is almost in the danger of being crowded out, and yet I don't want to have Mendel disappear in, the, in all this. You were also <clears throat> involved in a film called The Thread of Life, which has been used a lot around the country. Yes, and it was a, an interesting experience to find out how Hollywood works and, and how much many, many hours of works goes into what finally appears as one 50-minute talk. The famous theoretical population genetics textbook by you and Kimura. Could you talk about that? Right. A bit? Well, I've, I started teaching population genetics fairly soon and just gradually developed more and more material. And when Kimura was still in Madison, or at least maybe on his first visit back, we decided to write a book together. That was in the 50s and 60s. He was busy and I was busy and neither of us got around to getting it done. It was finally published in 1970, but uh, <coughs> much of what was in there i have been working on over a period of years. And the perspectives that you edit mm -hmm. and write many of for genetics, mm -hmm. how did your involvement in that come about? It started with Jan Drake. He called me up one time and he said that uh, he would like to start a column called Perspectives and he knew I was a person who could meet a deadline. Well, if you flatter me, I'll accept anything. And so I quickly agreed to do it. And so I got Bill Dove to join me in this venture. So I have written several of these things, not always uh, because I chose to, but we, uh, there's a, I said I had a certain amount of the show must go on principle in this. And uh, probably four or five times at least when the author is defaulted, I've simply substituted. In some cases, I've had something ready but in some cases, I simply spent a what, day of hard work and uh, quickly prepared one of these to, to fit in. Winston Churchill <laughs> once said that as he grew older, he felt closer and closer to predecessors in previous centuries. Mm -hmm. Do you have that same sort of feeling? Uh, I, I wonder if you'd comment <coughs> on some of the historical figures in genetics. Well, I um, place Galton on a high pedestal. I realize that, uh, that he's uh, tarred and feathered now for, for the founding eugenics, which is, has a black eye. But uh, Galton was really a remarkable guy. He, uh, he thought of using twins for separating heredity and environment. He developed the idea of using fingerprints and quantified a way of measuring them. He invented regression. <coughs> and uh, what else? And uh, I think, and I heard Sturdivant say this one time, if he, if he, if he were asked uh, who would most likely have understood Mendel's work if he'd known about it, he said his candidate was Galton. Galton had, was sufficiently mathematical to have understood it. We also said that, that uh, Galton was more likely to be interested in discrete characters than Darwin was, mm -hmm. which he clearly was. I think Darwin, I think Galton really was one of the great 19th century figures, all right, and uh, he's one of my heroes. How about Morgan? He was lucky in having three brilliant <laughs> students. I'm in some of that category myself, so I could, I could be <laughs> empathetic with him. Uh, of course, he was. Uh, of course, he did great things. But, but having Sturdivant, Bridges, and Muller, all at once, must have been, must have been quite a, quite a, quite an event. All those people in one fly room, talking all the time. There was a little bit like that in Austin at the uh, fly lab. There, it was a bigger room, and we weren't so weren't so crowded. But there were all people in the room at once, and uh, you could hear the various conversations. I want to write a little less. I'm going to do it. <clears throat> with Bob Wagner for a perspective series, uh, just about the, I'm going to call it the second fly lab, uh, the one that started up around Very Muller at, at the University of Texas. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a bit about your role in the science outside your research and teaching? I was chairman Wisconsin. of the department. I actually served as acting dean of the medical school. It was a challenge and an interesting one, and, but I was glad to stop and go back to, to teaching, and happily, <clears throat> During that time, the research work that was going on in my lab uh, was pretty well planned in advance, and it didn't require my day-to-day -day attention at all. So I think most people outside of Madison didn't know that the work had slowed, <laughs> had slowed up, but it, it certainly had as far as what was in my mind. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I was chairman of the genetics department for many years. I had one nice privilege for comparative purposes. I was chairman of the genetic studies section when it was quite young in the 60s. And then again, just a few years ago, 
and there's a big contrast, all right. In those, in the early days when there was enough money to go around and almost every good project got, got funded, it was fun being on the study section. Now, when, when you know that off, a lot of good work's not going to be supported, it's very, it's very discouraging, at least for me. And there are some people who I, <coughs> I know you admire that should be mentioned in, in the context of scientific administration. One is Kay Wilson. Yes, I admire her enormously. She was a, a, a sort of epitomizes to me the really conscientious public servant. She ran this study section with the velvet glove, but nonetheless her presence was always there. She, uh, <clears throat> she insisted on scrupulous fairness. We should talk about the National Science Foundation and Herman Lewis, who was yes. heavily involved early in genetics. Uh, I think he was a great leader for that, uh, for that group. And uh, I, uh, I want, I, what I want to do is, is have a perspectives in the near future on him, just as we did on uh, Kay Wilson for NIH. Uh, one thing that you were involved in was atomic testing, atmospheric testing, and uh, radiation-induced mutation. Yeah, well, I, I did follow Mueller fairly closely in this, in this area, and I wrote quite a number of articles uh, uh, cautioning against the dangers of radiation. Um, I, I wasn't quite as extreme as Mueller was. Uh, and I feel now that he and I, by reflection, uh, really caused, uh, caused the public to have an exaggerated view of the dangers of, of radiation compared with other, with other dangers. Anyhow, Mueller certainly won that argument with the public, and our radiation standards now are very, very strict. Mm. You were also dragged into the recent DNA typing controversy. You were I was chairman of a committee that wrote a report on use of DNA for for forensic investigation. I think the report's been pretty well received. It uh, was published in 1996. Uh, and then recently, I've been on one, and just finishing up right now, uh, by the National Institute of Justice. Uh, it, this was instigated by Janet Reno uh, when she found out these cases that had been, people had been um, mistakenly arrested and were finally cleared by DNA evidence. It's pretty clear that the techniques are going to get better and better, but it's also clear that the uh, particular STR loci, the 13 that have been made sacrosanct by the FBI, are going to stay around for a while. It's too expensive to, too expensive to change them. What sort through, of directions do you see genetics heading? I think it certainly through certainly various aspects of protein function and three-dimensional structure of proteins and structure-function relationships. That's almost certain to become important. Uh, I think we'll have a better understanding of the mind. Uh, we're beginning to right now, at least in an anatomical sense. And uh, I just wonder if it isn't likely to happen in the next future, maybe not immediately, but we'll, that maybe we'll have some real molecular understanding of what it means to think or to remember. Uh, if about, so, that'll be exciting times. What about the field of population and evolutionary genetics? Uh, that was, for a while, was sort of decadent, I think, because of uh, the, there was lots of good theory and practically no data to apply it to. Now the situation's the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, the data are abundant. And I think the field is having a resurgence, uh, especially, especially in using molecular techniques to trace evolutionary history. For that matter, though, uh, Developmental techniques are being used, and uh, morphological descriptive evolution is back in the forefront again. For some reason or other, what was regarded as dull stuff when we when you were talking about leaves and fur uh, becomes exciting stuff when you're talking about proteins. And yet, it's the the principles seem essentially the same to me. Uh, so we're going to learn a lot more about uh, evolution, and especially about human ancestry. I've been impressed with the fact that how revealing it is that. Uh, to compare the consequences of Y chromosome with mitochondrial DNA, where one's tracing male lineage and female lineage, and how it's telling us about the uh, differential migration of the two sexes mm -hmm. in, our, in our recent past. I'm also interested in some of these cases where the Y chromosome has been transmitted through many generations, like the uh, Jewish Y chromosome yes. in Africa, yes. Yes. which uh, uh, it, it's, it's made to what I used to think, everybody thought I think, was simply folklore, in fact, correct that the, that the Y chromosome does descend way back. If you were uh, entering graduate school in genetics now, what fields would be most attractive to you? I think molecular evolution still would be all right to me. And uh, 
Uh, I, might mod I might just consider neurobiology. It seems to me there's great, great excitement there. You must have had numerous opportunities to leave the University of Wisconsin. Yes, I have, yeah. And, and, and what is it particularly that has held you there? Uh, two things, really. Uh, one is my family was all settled in there and didn't really want to move. And then I'd been uh, quite instrumental and worked hard at it to get Sewell Wright to come there. And the time when I was getting offers for other jobs was, was back in those years. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked me now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the only time I seriously considered leaving Wisconsin was to go to Stanford at the time when Joshua Letterberg went there. But I've regretted losing this day-to-day -day contact with Letterberg because when, he, when we were together, we talked every day, and uh, it was... a uh, it was a one-way flow of ideas. I had got an awful lot from him, and I still do. We correspond and visit occasionally. You've had a remarkably rich and diverse research career. Of all the things that you've worked on, which, in retrospect, do you now think was the most important? Well, the one I had the most fun with, I think, was isonomy, just because it was cute. Mm -hmm. It's certainly not the most important. I, I think the purely uh, accidental thing that happened, the P factor and the meiotic drive, in some ways are, but, uh, but uh, I would say the m most important really has not been any one experiment, for it, but a more or less a persistent study of uh, variability of natural populations and how that's maintained and partial dominance and the other uh, uh, growth out of this. I also think that, uh, 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 that I've made some substantial contributions to theoretical population genetics, but mostly these have been in collaboration. Uh, I worked very well with Kimura. By, uh, I did the biology and he did the math. And it was a nice team effort. It lasted all the way up to the neutral theory. I want to quickly just say, though, that, that although I had a large part in much of Kimura's thinking, the neutral theory is entirely his. I don't know how much of evolution is neutral, but it's a very important contribution, in my view, uh, to evolutionary theory. Uh, but as far as things that I actually participated in, mainly myself, uh, I, I think the general work on genetic load and things that grew out of that is probably what's been the most important, most satisfying in any case. Uh, the mathematical contributions that I've made, some of them are rather, the ones that are rather simple mathematically are the ones I've just been talking about. But when I got into any kind of stochastic problem, or complicated mathematical problem. It's usually been with an association with someone else. It was Morton in some cases, and but especially Kimura over the over the years, and more recently Nagalaki. Uh, and I think maybe my best work has really been to uh, uh, incite them to do the mathematics in in areas which has turned out to be productive. My life has been characterized more by diversity than by systematic concentration on one or two subjects. Um, it's been richer for that reason and enjoyable, but I'm, I'm not sure about what that means from a standpoint of contribution. If I have a legacy, part of it is collaborative work that I've done with other people. But I want to say part of my legacy is students. I, I've had an unusually good group of graduate students and postdocs, uh, many of which have gone on to make names for themselves in genetics. and. I think I like to think of that as my real, as my real legacy.